What's up everyone? Welcome to my second Castlevania video. About a year ago, I made a video where I beat the entirety of Castlevania Aria of Sorrow with only the handgun, and a lot of people suggested I do the same with Dawn of Sorrow, its sequel, which I've thought about, but in my opinion, the handgun in Dawn isn't exactly challenge run material, if that makes any sense. In Aria of Sorrow, the handgun was not only tied with the bamboo sword for being the weakest weapon in the game, but it also had a hidden effect where it cut your strength in half when equipped, making it even weaker than your bare hands when equipped. In Dawn, it's not only substantially more powerful, but it no longer has that strength having effect, so I wouldn't really consider it a handicap to try to beat the game with it. I've been wanting to revisit Dawn of Sorrow for a while because it is my favorite Castlevania game, Aria of Sorrow is my second favorite, so what can I do for Dawn of Sorrow? Well. How about trying to beat the game with no weapons at all? When you don't have anything equipped, Soma will just punch, which technically counts as a weapon according to the game's code, but without using cheats, it can only be equipped by having nothing else equipped. Given the way many of the bosses in the game are designed, you might say that this is borderline masochism, but it's been a while since we've had a truly punishing challenge, and the rules pretty much speak for themselves. No weapons can be equipped, and I cannot use souls with damaging effects except for when they're necessary to access parts of the castle, which you will see later in the video. Oh, and I'm also going to be allowing the use of the slide kick because I need to make use of it to get around, and it doesn't even do that much damage anyway, so it won't really be effective against bosses for purposes other than dodging. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into the video. But first, a word from our sponsor. Did you know that two-thirds of men will experience hair loss before the age of 35? I'm sure many of you have seen it, and you may be worried that this will happen to you. Well, I have the perfect solution to ensure that you will keep your hair throughout most of your life. Keeps. Keeps is a hair loss prevention service that is both affordable and convenient. With it, you get hair loss prevention products that are clinically proven to work delivered straight to your door at normally what is about half the cost of what most pharmacies offer. And all plans are personalized for whatever needs you may have. Plus you get 24-7 support with a doctor for up to a year. Not to mention, through Keeps, you can also get award-winning shampoo and conditioner, so all that hair you do get to keep stays clean and smells good. Be sure to check out Keeps using the link down below in the description. That is keeps.com slash gnarly to get 50% off your first order. And seeing as how hair loss isn't reversible once it starts, I suggest doing it sooner rather than later. Once again, that is keeps.com slash gnarly. I want to give a big thank you to Keeps for sponsoring this video, and now, let's get back to the video. So, the game starts off with a brief recap of the last game, which then cuts to everyone's favorite supermodel, Soma Cruz, and his girlfriend, Mina, who are on a date, and also look considerably more anime than before. Yeah, one of the reasons people aren't too fond of Dawn of Sorrow is because it replaced the whole gothic painting art style with this generic anime style, but I'll be honest, for Dawn of Sorrow, I kind of prefer it like this. Don't get me wrong, I don't think it's better than Kojima's art, but Dawn of Sorrow does take itself a lot less seriously than the other games, which is why I think the Friday Night Shonen anime art style is a little more fitting here. But anyway, Mina randomly asks Soma if he has any of the powers he gained from Dracula's castle last year, and immediately after she does, some woman suffering from argyrosis named Celia shows up, and then summons a skeleton. Alucard then shows up, throws Soma a knife, but Soma doesn't need it, and proceeds to beat the skeleton along with the Spear Knight and even the Golem, with his bare hands, which is a little difficult, but nothing I can't handle. Alucard warns Soma not to get involved, which Soma happily ignores and heads to the cult's hideout, which seems to be a copy of Dracula's castle. After punching my way through the first area, we encounter Yoko and Julius from the last game. Julius runs ahead, and Yoko accompanies us up until the first boss, the Flying Armor. Now, the Flying Armor being the first boss is pretty easy. He just kind of floats around and has two swords, which he attacks with in very slow and predictable motions. The biggest challenge of this boss, and most of the bosses going forward really, is trying to hit him without getting too close and taking damage, which does happen quite a lot in the first attempt, and I do go down, but I pretty much have him figured out in my second attempt. Just jump, punch, and then immediately turn back. I do this until he's defeated, where I have to activate a magic seal, where I have to move the stylus, or in my case, the mouse, in a V-shaped motion. Yeah, another reason people don't like Dawn of Sorrow is because in order to beat the bosses, you have to use magic seals on them. If you screw this up, they'll get... 
I think like a quarter of their HP back, but I'm not entirely sure. With this being one of the first games on Nintendo's newest system with its fancy new touchscreen, a lot of companies felt the need to shoehorn in mechanics like this just to get some use out of it. Either way, it's annoying and for this reason I won't be able to use a controller like I did in the last video, because I'll need to be able to grab the mouse as fast as I can to draw the seal. That also means no turbo button, although the emulator I'm using does have an auto-fire functionality, but I'm going to see how far I can get before feeling the need to use it. But anyway, I get the seal on my first try, and I am able to defeat the boss. After that, I reach an area where Yoko and Hammer set up shops across from one another. Due to this challenge, I won't be able to use Yoko's services, but Hammer will be my primary source of healing items, although I don't need any right now. A little further in, and I reach the Wizardry Lab, and the enemies here are kind of a pain. Most of them have attacks that are easy to dodge, but they're only taking one damage per hit, like the bomb armors and the slimes. And the ones that don't, like the scorpion lions, the creatures, and the pig guys, have more than enough HP to make up for it. Well, it's not long before we meet Celia again, along with her two Dark Lord candidates, Dmitri Blinov and Dario Busi. And not long after that, we have to fight the next boss, Balor. Balor seems to have undergone quite a transformation since the last game. Rather than him standing in the background and fighting with both his hands, he only uses one, and now his whole head is a target, not just his eye. Other than that, this fight actually plays quite similarly. Balor has three attacks, an uppercut, some kind of double punch, and his ultimate laser of death. Oddly enough, the one you want him to use the most is his laser attack since all you have to do to avoid it is crouch. His uppercut attack can be kind of unpredictable, but he doesn't go for this too often. His double punch is probably his most favored attack, and it will seem unpredictable at first, but eventually, through trial and error, you will learn that he's about to go for it when he pulls his fist towards him, and you can easily dodge it by crouching and then jumping. Now, as for dealing damage, you basically just jump and punch him in the face. You can stand on his fist, but I don't recommend doing this because you won't be able to hit him. My punches are doing 6 damage each. It may seem like an insignificant amount, but it gets the job done, and after a couple of attempts, 3 minutes, and 1 magic seal, I am able to take him down. My reward is the ability soul that allows me to break ice blocks by touching them. I use it to move on to the next area, the Garden of Madness. Now, the enemies here don't really pose much of a threat, but there are these little weeds growing out of the ground that I can't actually hit with my fists, even when I'm crouching. So all I can do for now is just jump over them. Although this isn't actually where I'm supposed to be, the next actual part of the castle is the Dark Chapel. And this is where things are starting to get annoying. As soon as you enter, you gotta start dealing with these red devils and witches that fly around and shoot at you. And because of how they move, hitting them is pretty much impossible. And then in the ballroom, you have these dancers flying around everywhere in wavy patterns and these angels that fly in and shoot arrows at you. What you're supposed to do is take them out with ranged souls like the axes, but that's just not possible for obvious reasons. So all I can really do is just ignore them, which isn't exactly easy to do because their attacks are pretty strong. Before I even reach the boss, I die, I think like maybe three or four times. And once I do get to the boss, Dimitri, things don't go well. Dimitri may not sound so tough on paper. He only has two attacks, a knife attack, which he rarely uses, and this magic ball attack, kind of similar to what Dracula uses. It travels very slowly, but it's also very big, and keep in mind you don't have your double jump yet, so in order to dodge, your timing has to be perfect, or else you're taking a hit. The worst part, though, is that your post-hit invincibility after being hit with one of these is pretty much non-existent. If one of these things hits you, you're probably going to take more than one hit, and if one hits you head on, it can easily hit four, five, sometimes six times. And to me, it's doing 32 damage, so that's easily over half my health. Normally, this wouldn't be too big a deal because I could just use ranged weapons, but with how little range my fists have, it's pretty much just punch him once, then back away and keep repeating until he's dead. Well, at least that's what I think, but after a few attempts, I actually figure out a better strategy, and it requires you to play very aggressively. You see, when he uses his ball attack, it takes about a second to materialize and do damage. If you stand in just the right spot in front of him, he'll go for this attack, and as soon as he does, you run toward him, jump over to the other side, and then start punching. Usually you can get two, sometimes three punches off by doing this, and if he steps or flies back, well, it's easy to just follow him and keep repeating this. 
That being said, he probably will be able to sneak in a hit or two every now and then, especially when he uses his knife, but as long as you have a good amount of potions and patience, you should be able to take him down. And because he's not a monster, you don't have to worry about using a magic seal here. And almost immediately after, I have to fight another boss, Malfoss, and this boss is pretty much a joke once you figure out his attack pattern. Right off the bat, he'll be standing on the ground in the middle of the arena, giving you plenty of time to land a few punches. Then he'll fly up and start attacking. He has this one attack where he launches a bunch of birds at you, which is pretty much impossible to dodge if you get caught in his range, but as long as you're directly under him, it won't hit. Then there's this attack where he launches some homing balls of darkness your way, and all you gotta do here is run away and jump over them. And then there's this attack where he'll launch feathers left and right, which, again, just stay under him, and they won't hit you. Between his attacks, just jump and punch. Every now and then he'll just randomly decide to land on the ground to, I guess, gather more birds, and this is a great opportunity to do some damage. When he does this, just keep punching him for as much damage as you can deal, use the seal, and he will be defeated. And my reward for beating him is the double jump ability, which will not only make future bosses easier, but opens up so much more of the castle. Up next, I have to go to the Garden of Madness, where I have to fight the other Dark Lord candidate, Dario. Now, the fight against Dario actually plays nothing like the one against Dimitri. He has three attacks, one where he'll summon three pillars of fire, kind of like Dracula in some of the earlier games, one where he'll punch the ground and launch a wave that's much easier to dodge now that I have the double jump soul, and one where he'll wave his arm forward and shoot a fireball at you. What's kind of funny about this move is that if you're standing close enough to him, his attack will actually go right through you because his arm goes through you and the fireball launches behind you. I don't recommend doing this though because your placement has to be pixel perfect and it makes his other attacks nearly impossible to dodge. Other than that, there's really not a lot to say. He has a whole lot of HP and my attacks aren't doing as much to him as they were to Dimitri. His attacks are easier to dodge, but because of the way they work, I don't get as much time to hit him when he's vulnerable. It's pretty much just a repeating cycle of wait for him to attack, land a few punches, back away, and repeat. It takes a total of about 8 minutes, which is considerably longer than the other bosses, but eventually I am able to take him down. Next, I have to head on over to the Demon Guest House, and the enemies here aren't too much of a problem. Ones like the Liliths and the Karate Maids are pretty easy to take out because they specialize in close range attacks and are very susceptible to my punches. There's also this slide puzzle room where I can create my own pathway to different parts of the dungeon, and at the end you have to fight the Puppet Master. Now, your first time fighting this boss, you'll probably just be attacking him, and then you'll randomly pop out of an Iron Maiden and get hit for like a third of your health, and then you'll be thinking, wait, what just hit me? Until you figure out that he attacks you by making these mannequins that he puts into one of the four Iron Maidens, and that, along with the smaller dolls he spits out, are his only means of attack. You have to destroy the mannequins before he puts them into the Iron Maidens, which, in this case, takes two punches. Sounds easy enough, but you have to remember you also have to deal with these dolls flying around. And these things go down in three punches, but either way, you don't really have time to deal with these things. As soon as he starts his attack, you just have to start running toward whichever side of the room he's doing it on, and hope that you don't run into too many of the dolls on your way there. The dolls deal 23 damage each time I bump into them, which may sound like a problem, but it's a much better alternative than taking a hit from the Iron Maidens. Overall, stopping them isn't too much of a challenge. It takes me a couple of attempts, but once I figure out how to do it, it isn't too hard. It's pretty much just an endurance round. You basically just have to keep knocking out the mannequins, hitting the main body, and hoping you don't take too much damage from the dolls. The only strategy is to just bring along as many potions as you can afford. I'm able to beat him, but when the magic seal comes up, I screw it up, so I have to fight him a little bit longer. And this is where the magic seal kind of starts to become a problem. Because the further into the game you get, the more complicated the magic seals get, and the harder the bosses get as well. Let's just hope this doesn't become a common theme going forward. After this, I get the Puppet Master Soul, which allows me to go into the Condemned Tower, and the next boss is one of the most infamous bosses in the game, Gurgoth. And let's just say it doesn't go well. 
I'll go into detail later, but for now, I just do not have the resources I need to stand a chance against this boss. What I need is to have a better means to increase my attack, and there are two ways to do this that I have access to in this point of the game. The first is the War Fatigues armor, which I get from the Demon Guest House. The next thing is the Black Belt, which is a rare drop from the Werewolves, and... Yeah, being a rare drop, this is gonna take a while. The only werewolf at this point in the game is a few floors down in the Condemned Tower from where I fight Gurgoth, and taking out dozens of them repeatedly is not easy. Though it is made a little easier with the auto-fire function enabled, which at this point, I decide to do. Now, just like in the last game, there is an item to increase the drop rate, the rare ring, but I don't have access to it at this point in the game. At least under normal circumstances, I actually didn't know this until now, but apparently if you have a cartridge for Aria of Sorrow in the GBA slot of your DS, you can actually begin the game with a rare ring. It's too late now, but this is another feature a lot of early DS games had, and honestly, I think it's pretty cool. Well, just when I'm about ready to give up, I finally get a black belt, and after this, there's only one other thing left to do. Grind. Fortunately, the Condemned Tower has the perfect grinding spot. Right outside one of the middle rooms, there's a great axe armor. These guys are worth 300 experience apiece, and with auto fire on, are extremely easy to take down. See, when Soma punches some enemies, their attacks are interrupted for about a single frame. With Soma repeatedly punching them at the highest possible frequency, in most cases he can take them down before they can even attack. And this is especially true with the great axe armors. I grind until I'm level 28, and with that, I think I'm ready to take on the boss. Now, getting back into why this weird, undead, bipedal dinosaur is so difficult, for starters, the arena this fight takes place in is extremely small, and this thing is huge. It takes up well over two-thirds of the screen. Second, its attacks hit like a freight train, specifically his laser attack, but this is extremely easy to dodge. The real challenge from this fight comes from his size. If you bump into pretty much any part of his body, you're taking a hit, and while most of its attacks are easy to dodge, his body isn't. One of his attacks has him use this weird vacuum effect where he'll follow it up with a bite, and here you have two options, either back away or crouch very close to his legs. Doing so here without taking damage requires you to be pixel perfect. If you try to take the safer route and back away, his attack will probably miss, but you'll probably later get hit just by bumping into him while he's leaning forward, so pick your poison. Speaking of poison, his most potentially devastating attack is where he'll either release a toxic or petrifying cloud from his chest. Once again, in most cases, this can easily be dodged by just backing away and punching the fumes away from you. But if he pins you into the corner and uses the petrifying one, you are dead. Your only option is to jump up and use the Puppet Master Soul to get to the other side, where you're probably going to take a couple of hits, but at least you'll still be alive. His last attack is one where he just jumps at you. The way you're supposed to avoid this is by moving toward and sliding under him, but again, if you're too far away when he goes for this, you're getting crushed and taking well over 100 damage. As for dealing damage, well, he's a pretty big target, so it's easy to just jump and punch, but your best opportunities are when he uses his laser and vacuum attacks. If you crouch next to his feet when he does these attacks, you'll be able to land several punches and get some good damage on him. I'm dealing 8 damage with each punch, which isn't great, but it's better than the 5 I was doing before I grinded. Once you get him down to about half health, he'll break the floor and send both you and him plummeting to the bottom of the tower. While falling, you can deal some more damage, but don't get too greedy, because if you're close to him when you hit the ground, you'll be taking more damage. You'd think this part would be much harder, but this phase of the boss is pretty much the same as the first, with the only difference being that his laser attack comes out slightly faster. Just keep doing what you were doing before, and eventually he will go down. And then pray to God that you get the seal right on your first attempt, which I do, and with that, Gurgoth is no more. Up next, we have the most frustratingly annoying part of the entire game. The Cursed Clock Tower. I say it's frustrating because not only are there spikes everywhere, but it's home to infamous enemies like the Medusa Heads and those tiny devils flying around that possess you. The Medusa Heads are at least weak and easy to dodge, but those tiny devils, those things are from hell. Hitting them with just your fist is pretty much impossible. You just have to keep moving and hope that they don't hit you, which isn't exactly easy with all the complicated platforming this section requires you to do. The boss at the end, though, is an entirely different beast. 
Say hello to Zephyr, the hardest boss of the run so far. Not only does this thing look like a rejected Spider-Man villain, but my attacks are back to only dealing one damage, and his attacks are much harder to dodge. Most of his attacks involve his claws, and with how close I have to get to hit him, there's pretty much no reliable way to predict these attacks and get out of the way in time. This boss is just out of the question right now, so you know what that means? Yeah, more grinding. I go back to the Condemned Tower and just go back to punching the armors in the groin until I'm level 37. And once I'm done, my punches are doing 3 damage to Zephyr. Now, Zephyr has a wide variety of slashing attacks, but his signature moves are the ones where he stops time. When he's about to go for one of these attacks, he'll laugh, and if you hit him when he's doing this, he'll freeze time and slash at you. If you're in his attack range but you don't hit him, he'll instead jump over you and launch some knives at you from above. I actually recommend letting him do this because this attack is the easiest to dodge and it's a good opportunity to get a few hits in. His other attacks involve things like hopping around, throwing knives, or just charging and slashing at you. Normally these attacks would be pretty easy to dodge, but again, with my short range, here it's much harder. I pretty much have to just go in, land three or four punches, and then back out before he can attack and just keep repeating this until he's dead. Although, it does seem that you could trick the AI into just constantly using his knife-throwing, time-stopping attack by standing in just the right spot, and that's what I do through most of this fight. This fight lasts about 10 minutes, and it also costs me most of my potions. It also uses a new magic seal, but thankfully I get it on my first try, and I'm able to beat Zephyr. <laughs> And my reward is the Time Stopping Soul, which is debatably the best soul in the game, because with my newfound power to stop time, I can finally give those stupid flying devils the what for. But anyway, this is one of those parts where I spend like an hour wandering around the castle like an idiot trying to figure out what to do. And then I remember that there apparently is a boss that I completely missed, that boss being Rahab. Now, Rahab is kind of annoying because you have to fight him in the water, and at this point I can't swim underwater, that's what his soul is for. You just have to swim around and wait for him to pop up and hit him. It's not what I would call hard, it's just annoying. You might have trouble predicting where he's going to come up, but bubbles appear in the water above where he is, so just follow the bubbles and when he comes up, punch him. His attacks are very easy to dodge, and as long as you stay close to him, most of them won't hit you. The only real threats are getting hit by his fins, but these are also pretty easy to avoid. My punches are doing 17 damage each, and he doesn't have a lot of HP, only about 1200, so it only takes a couple minutes before I bring him down. Now, because of how overleveled I am, pretty much all the enemies in the subterranean hell are a joke. I get to the Silence Ruins where, again, the enemies aren't very much of a problem, but the boss, the giant bat, or Bat Company as it's called in this game, is kind of a different story. And the main reason is because of how biased the hitbox for this boss is. In this situation, it's pretty much impossible to land a hit without him landing one too. This boss will also change forms, one to this thing that shoots circles at you, and another to this hand that'll grab and crush you if it touches you. It's best to just avoid it when it's in these forms. When it turns into a bat, that's your chance to attack. Thankfully, my attacks are still doing solid damage, and this boss doesn't have a lot of HP. It's basically just another endurance round. Just attack and heal up until it's dead. <laughs> And my reward is the soul that allows me to turn into a bat, allowing access to pretty much any part of the castle, including the final area, the pinnacle. When I get here, the first thing I see is Yoko, and I step over to say hi, but then she knees me in the face, and that's how I find out that she's actually a succubus. But anyway, none of the enemies here are really that much of a problem, and before long I reach the supposed final boss chamber. Of course, if there's anything you should have learned from Castlevania by now, it's that it's never that simple. And in order to get the true ending here, we need the Paranoia Soul, who is fought in the Demon Guest House, which you can only get by using very specific souls to break the blocks in the way, those being the Killer Clown Soul, the Axe Armor Soul, and the Ukobox Soul. Now, this guy likes to hide in the mirror, and when he does, he'll shoot out a laser which reflects off of three other mirrors. 
I recommend turning into a bat when he does this so that you can avoid the ground where you're at the highest risk of getting hit and also because of the fact that it makes you a smaller target. Once he's done this enough, he'll step out of the mirror and attack you with a knife, and from here, it's pretty much a joke. His knife attack is only doing 16 damage, and it's another one of those cases where every punch I land slows him down a little bit. The game seems to want you to be careful and try to avoid his knife, but it's so insignificant, I recommend just taking the hits and keep attacking. If you do this, it won't take long before you move on to his second phase, and this is where things start to get difficult. The tactics are pretty much the same, only the laser is now bigger and more powerful, and you really don't want to get hit by this thing, especially on the ground, because with how long it lasts, it can easily hit you two or three times. He also pops out of the mirror less frequently. When he does, he hovers over you, and when he's about to step on you, you get out of the way and then attack him while he's going down. This is another one of those fights that doesn't beat you by running you out of health, but by running you out of patience. Because of how much health he has and how small the window to attack him is, you are in for a really long fight. My final attempt took around 15 minutes, which, for Castlevania standards, is ridiculous. Not to mention all the potions I used. I also screwed up a magic seal, which, you know, was fun, but I was able to take him out and collect his soul. Now, you probably noticed some dead-end mirror rooms when exploring, well, now you can actually get some use out of them. They pretty much only have treasures, but the treasures they do have are very good. The only ones I need are the Dracula's Tunic and the Megging... Me Me Megging Jor, both of which provide the best attack boosters in the game, and once I have them, it's time to face the true boss of the pinnacle, Agni, the monster that is possessing Dario, and this boss is a completely different beast from the ones we've been fighting up until now. He's big, he moves around really fast, and his attacks are very strong, and there's no reliable way to consistently deal damage to him while using only my fists. Yeah, I'm gonna need to do a little more prepping, and you know what that means? More grinding. And where do I do this? Well, the axe guy isn't really cutting it anymore, but there is another spot that's great for grinding in the pinnacle. There's this hallway that has a whole bunch of succubi standing in a row. The succubi have a very short attack range, so all you do is just go down the line and beat the crap out of them one by one. I do this until I'm level 50. There is one other thing that I do, and that is get the Dead Crusader Soul, which reduces all the damage I take. I've pretty much been exclusively using the Golem Soul, since that's the only soul in this game that increases strength, but unequipping it doesn't actually seem to make any difference in damage, and I think having a soul that increases my defense is better anyway. With all that, I attempt the Agni fight again. Now, what makes this fight so hard is that, unlike most of the other bosses where they've had good windows to hit them, Agni doesn't. He's always floating around, with his only vulnerable spots being his hands. And with how fast he moves around, jumping up to hit him without taking damage is not easy. Now, as for his attacks, he has one where he tries to swipe you with his claws, which you can easily avoid by just sliding out of the way. He has one where he flies up and comes crashing back down, which releases waves of fire on both sides, and one where he'll stay in place and launch waves of fire at you repeatedly. This is the best one because it's the easiest to avoid and it gives you the most time to deal damage, but again, you have to jump up repeatedly, so you'll probably be able to land 7 or 8 hits on him if you're lucky. Otherwise, you'll just have to keep avoiding him because his other attacks hardly leave you any room to counter with anything. Although... Oddly enough, his worst attack isn't even really an attack, it's actually the one where he just sways either left and right, because, again, bumping into him hurts you, but there's also not a good way to predict when he's going to be doing this. And also, if you're standing on the ground, that little thing under his belly will scrape your head and also deal damage. At least I'm dealing okay damage with each hit, but that doesn't prevent this fight from lasting a very long time. Again, it lasts about 15 minutes and costs me most of my potions, but I am able to beat him on my first attempt, and thankfully, I get the magic seal my first time. After that, Dario just runs off, then Celia shows up, and we have to follow her to a now unlocked room in the Garden of Madness. So we go, and we see Mina, who Celia kills, which obviously Soma isn't too happy about. Now, if you just go in, Soma will become the Dark Lord, and you'll get one of the bad endings. But, if you equip Mina's Talisman, which you should have gotten from Alucard earlier, 
Alucard stops him, and then it's revealed that Mina here is actually a fake, and Dimitri's soul went into Soma when he died. He reveals that he copied Soma's powers and now intends to become the Dark Lord himself. So now we have to follow him to the Mine of Judgment, and through here it's not long until we reach the boss, the infamous Grim Reaper. Now, if you've ever played Castlevania, generally the Grim Reaper is one of the hardest bosses in the game. He actually wasn't too bad in Aria, but that might be because you fight him pretty early on. Here, that is not the case, and the first couple of attempts do not go well. Again, it's another similar deal to the Agni fight where he's always floating, but here at least his hitbox is a little more forgiving, but it's still annoying to have to just keep jumping up to hit him. If only I had some way to stay airborne and attack. Well, I actually do. The Medusa Head Soul does just that, so I grind for one in the clock tower, come back, and this makes a world of differences. Now, getting back to the boss, death may look intimidating after he beats you in your first couple of attempts, but once you learn his attack pattern, it's actually not that bad. For his attacks, he has one where he spins his scythe, which turns into a bunch of smaller scythes that fly across the screen, and they can easily be blocked by just attacking them. He also has this one attack where he'll create holograms of himself in attack, which is very easy to dodge, and finally, one where he'll swing his scythe over his head vertically, then horizontally. This is actually the attack you want the most because you can easily avoid it by sliding out of the way and just crouching to avoid the second one. Afterwards, you can follow it up with some punches. It also seems like you can trick him into doing this again by standing in just the right spot. Just don't let him pin you into a corner with this because if that happens, you won't be able to dodge. Either way, my punches aren't doing a whole lot, so this is definitely going to be a long fight, but not too hard of one. At least that's what I thought until I got to the second phase, and this is where things start to get really difficult. Not only does Death have a smaller hitbox now, but his attacks come out much faster and are much harder to dodge. His most favored attack is the one where he throws his spinning scythe at you, and if you're directly under him, which you probably will be if you're trying to hit him, there's pretty much nothing you can do to avoid this attack other than run in one direction and hope that his scythe goes flying in a different one, and then jumping when it comes back around to you. The second one, he teleports next to you and pulls his scythe back. Obviously, you don't want to get hit with his scythe, but here you're more likely to just bump into him than you are to actually get hit with his scythe. Either way, it's gonna hurt. And lastly, and easily the worst attack, is the one where he'll try to bite you with these giant skulls. He does this by shooting lasers out of his hands in both directions, and the first time you'll probably be thinking, huh, I wonder if he's shooting lasers out of his- Oh my god, I just got bit for 160 damage! Basically, you have to be running in the opposite direction to avoid their bites, and then, right before the other one comes, you run in the opposite direction, and your timing has to be perfect. If you're a nanosecond too early, you'll still take the hit, even if the biting animation has already finished, and if you're too late, well, that much should be obvious. This attack is possible to dodge, but don't let it catch you off guard, because if it does, it will really f*** you up. Oh, and if you haven't done this already, I recommend pausing the game and practicing the magic seal, because not only is the fifth magic seal the hardest, but the last thing you want to happen is to have to fight more of these long late game bosses. This fight takes about 15 minutes, but I do bring him down, and thankfully, I get the magic seal to work on my first attempt. And that is it for the Grim Reaper, but that's not going to be the last we see of him, because you can't avoid death. Whether it be Persona or Castlevania, either way, you're going to have to fight the Reaper. Now, after I beat him, I unlock the last section of the game, the Abyss, and it's pretty straightforward. The enemies here are tough, and most of them aren't affected by the time stop, so most of them I just decide to run past. There is one more boss before the final one, that being Abaddon, who doesn't attack you himself, he just sends swarm of locusts after you and the direction they come from and go to depends on how he moves his baton. Seems simple enough, but these swarms are actually very hard to dodge and are very likely to hit you multiple times. Some of them, I swear you have no choice but to take a hit. At least this boss doesn't have high defenses and has pretty low HP for a late game boss. There's really not a lot to say, it's pretty much just kill or be killed. Just get close to him and keep punching until he's down, and heal up when you get low on HP. Although... For whatever reason, this game does not seem to want to accept my magic seal, despite the fact that it worked just fine on death, and I also got it right after practicing multiple times in the menu. It just does not seem to want to accept my inputs here, and I really don't understand it. Did I just get lucky with the Grim Reaper? 
who knows. I mean, I eventually do get it, but it makes a boss that really should have only taken one attempt instead take five. Thankfully, this is the last boss of the game that requires the magic seal and the last mandatory boss before the final one. And almost immediately after, that's exactly what we have to fight. Dimitri, the final boss, or as the game calls it, just Menace. Now, this boss is divided into two stages. The first one has you trapped in this really small area and you have to hit its head. With the Medusa head soul, this first phase is a complete joke. As long as you're hovering next to the head and rapidly hitting him, he can't touch you with two out of his three attacks. You only have to worry about the spikes that come from the top, but you can easily move out of the way to avoid them. After that, go back to your punching until you move to his second phase. And this is where the difficulty gets cranked up well beyond 11. Not only is the menace 100 feet tall, but you have two very specific spots you have to hit him at. One on his left knee, and the other on his head. The problem here is that unlike the weak point in the first phase, neither of these have an easy way of repeatedly hitting him. When you attack the head, the skull around it closes its mouth, which not only prevents you from hitting him for a short while, but it will also damage you if it touches you. The one on his knee you can hit multiple times at once, but when you do, his other leg also has a hitbox that will more than likely hit you. And even if it doesn't, if you're using the Medusa head soul to score multiple hits, you're probably going to land on his foot on the way down. But the worst thing about this fight by far is these black Pac-Men that fly around and deal damage. They can chase you anywhere in the area. They move very fast, have a pretty good amount of HP, and there doesn't seem to be a limit on how many of them can be on screen at once. So. On top of having to chip away at the boss with its very small hit windows, you gotta dodge these floating mouths that just won't leave you alone. They're like flies at the dinner table. You can try to ignore them, but they just won't leave you alone. You're gonna have to deal with them at some point so that you can move on with your day. Only here, they're infinitely respawning. The best way to deal with them is once enough are on screen, you go into a corner, wait for them to come to you, and start punching. If you position yourself just right, they'll fly right into your punches and won't be able to hit you. Most of the time. It's tedious, but it's the only reliable way to get rid of these things. But even this isn't enough to beat the boss. He and these things are just dealing too much damage for me to be able to beat this boss with the resources I have. So what do I do? Grind all the way up to level 99? Yeah, that's all I can do, and it's exactly what I do. Back to go beat the crap out of some more poor succubi. I almost feel bad for them just punching them and their friends to death for hours, and by hours I mean a few minutes because I used an action replay code to speed up the process, because even I don't have the patience for this. There's one other thing I want to get, the Tan Jelly Soul, which reduces damage from physical attacks. Since pretty much all the attacks I'm going to be taking from the boss are physical, I figured this would be more helpful if it does have a greater effect than the Dead Crusader Soul, which it does, considerably. With it, the body is only doing around 50 damage, but the mouths are still doing over 100. Meanwhile, my punches are doing 20, which is a little less than I had hoped, but I'll still take it since it means with the 3,000 damage these body parts have, I'll be finishing them off in 150 hits. But this still just isn't enough. I know I've said that a lot of these bosses are endurance tests, but this one is the ultimate endurance test. I am going to need every resource the game will provide to me. I'm already at level 99 and have the best souls for this fight that the challenge will allow, so the only thing left is to just stock up on healing items. The only ones I can buy from Hammer Shop are potions and high potions, which I already have 9 of, but there are more that are random drops from enemies. The first three I want are the rotten food items, those being the rotten meat, the spoiled milk, and the rusty food tin. Normally these items deal damage if you consume them, but if you have the ghoul soul, which I do, you gain that HP instead. There are also these three delicacies, as the game calls them, all of which fully restore your HP, which I get, along with the super potion I came across, that does the same. And lastly, there are the normal food items that restore a good amount of HP, at least the ones that come from enemies that I can easily farm them from. The beef curry, the tasty meat, and the rice ball. I make sure to get as many as I can, and with that, I think it's time to attempt the boss again, hopefully for the last time. As usual, I blast my way through the first phase, and once the second phase starts, I decide to focus on the knee. And it goes about how I expect it to. With the help of the Medusa head soul, I'm able to land more consistent hits, but like I said before, this still doesn't protect me from the hazards I mentioned. 
There's also the added risk that you may get knocked toward its legs, which can easily lead to multiple hits. But thankfully, with the Tangeli Soul, it's not doing anywhere near as much as it's supposed to. There's also the fact that every few minutes I have to stop what I'm doing to go to one of the corners of the area and deal with the mouths. You want to know how much time it takes me to take out the first part? About 20 minutes. Yeah, I guess it shouldn't be too surprising considering how little damage I'm dealing, but by this time I'm already down quite a few potions, and considering what I said about the head earlier, the fun hasn't even started. After some trial and error, I am able to figure out a way to deal some decent damage over time, but it's still nowhere near the rate I was able to hit the leg, which itself wasn't even great. Basically, what I do is when he's close to the middle of the area, I just stand around the platforms, punch him, wait for him to be vulnerable again, and punch him again. But this only works so well, especially with, you know, the mouths. During this second part of the fight, I find myself having to stop what I'm doing to deal with the mouths a lot more often, and it's just tedious. It's really starting to try my patience. And that's what this whole fight is. Like, it's not a test of skill, it's a test of patience, especially when you hate yourself like me and play video games with handicaps. I should also mention that when attacking the head, I'm more susceptible to the Menace's own attacks. He has this one uppercut punch and one where he'll try to jab you. Both of these are pretty easy to dodge and don't do a lot of damage anyway, but it can be frustrating when you're trying to hit him, and you have to stop what you're doing to dodge one of these attacks, or he hits you and knocks you all the way to the ground. I also start to get a bit worried if, even after all that farming I did, if I'll even have enough food. It doesn't take me long to burn through my super potion and my delicacies, and the further in I go, the more I find myself getting hit by the mouths because my patience is starting to wane. Yeah, I want to deal with them, but doing that sets me back a couple of minutes, and even when I'm doing that, there's nothing to prevent one from just popping up from below and biting me in the butt. And that's what this whole fight is about. There are measures you can take to reduce damage and or speed things up, but there are going to be situations where you just can't avoid taking damage. In the footage you're seeing, a lot of the battle is going to be cut out, but this whole fight takes nearly an hour from the moment it starts to the moment it ends. It is a long and perilous fight, but just when I least expect it, I am able to land the final punch and take him out. And thank the Lord I don't have to activate a magic seal. Castle collapses, we get our heartwarming reunion, and then the credits roll. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It is possible to beat Dawn of Sorrow with only your fist. That was definitely the hardest challenge run I think I've ever done on this channel, but I hope you guys enjoyed. I've really been getting back into Castlevania recently, and I want to start doing more videos of it in the future, so be sure to let me know if you guys want to see more Castlevania videos, and if you have any ideas for challenges, let me know in the comments. As always, be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe. Be sure to check out my other links in the description, and consider leaving a Ko-Fi donation if you want to support me financially. Until the next video, I will see you all later.